My name is Buster Swoops. I'm an assistant professor of religion at Southwestern Adventist University, and I love, absolutely love being in the classroom, but I want to share with you a little testimony of something that I witnessed this, just this week. Uh, one of my fellow uh, uh, professors, Dr. Michael Campbell, his father is not doing so well, he's ill, and one of our students overheard us talking, and later on that evening and throughout last week, she kept texting Dr. Campbell and saying, I just want you to know that myself and a couple of friends of mine were coming together every day and we're praying for your father. You know, I, I hear that and it, it, this is what it's about. It's about faith in motion, not waiting till we get older, but recognizing right here, right now in the community of believers, we're all moving and that's something that I get to witness and experience every single day. Uh, as we're getting ready to open up our words today, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit be with us through a word of prayer. And then I want us to get straight into it as we look into James chapter 5, okay? So let's bow our heads forward a prayer. Lord God, I'm asking you to do something that I realize I'm not able to do, which is, Lord, help us to understand the word of God. Lord, I'm asking that you open up our hearts, you open up our minds, and God, you give us clear and concise steps to do in order to achieve and receive transformation that only your Holy Spirit can do. So God, may we walk out of here, change men, change women, change, bo change boys, and change girls as a result of us choosing to live our faith out in the plurality and not singularity alone. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Just heard in my prayer, the title of our sermon today is called The Plurality of Faith. And there re there's a reason for that. I, I want to share with you what prompted this thought, and it actually came from kidministryscience.com. And they focused in on a study that recognized that 75% of our young people are leaving church. And this is cross-denominationally, so it's happening both uh, in Sunday churches, it's happening in the Adventist church. And they said 75% are leaving, but, but there's 25% are stay, staying. Instead of us focusing in on the 75% that are leaving, let's ask the question, why are the 25% staying? George Barna has done some of this research as well. And, and these, I'm starting at number five, the reasons why they stay. If, you have, if you're a parent or a grandparent, anything like that, you want to pay attention to this. Number five, they ate dinner with family five to seven nights a week. Amen to that, right? They actually sat down, I, I believe, turn off the television, asking each other about each other's lives, what's going on. One of my favorite times in, in life is actually sitting down for a meal. Uh, my wife is very good at it, you know, probably a little bit too good, but, you know, it's great. Uh, our family enjoys that time we have together. But number, number uh, four here, they served with family in ministry. So actually not just coming and attending church, but actually being involved in ministry. Number three, they had one spiritual experience in the home during the week. Now, I did share this during first service. Uh, we experienced this not too long ago. Uh, as per usual, I'm running out the, the door and I can't find my wallet. Anybody else there? Okay, I'm the only one. All right, uh, so I'm looking all over the place. Maybe it's your keys, whatever it might be. And my daughter asked a silly question. She's six years old. Hi, Raina. Uh, Raina says, Daddy, have you prayed and asked Jesus to help you find your wallet yet? I'm like, of course I prayed. No, I didn't pray yet. All right. <laughs> and so you know what she did? She prayed. And she prayed this just the simplest prayer. Jesus, help Daddy find his wallet. And we said, Amen. And wouldn't you know it, within two minutes, I found the wallet. It was in the covers of the bed. Don't ask how it got there. Maybe she planted it there. I don't know, right? But we found the wallet. And what is really neat is we always talk about God is not only concerned with the big portions of our lives, he's concerned with the small portions of our lives. Number two, entrusted with responsibility in ministry in an early age. My wife uh, totes this. This is my lovely wife, Lauren, down here. Wave, sweetie. All right. Uh, she, she, she shares that one of the things that really got her interested in spiritual things was when she was 15 or 16 years old, she was actually invited to be a part of the church board as a, church, as a children's ministries leader. And, and uh, I think the meetings, uh, they're so boring that she's never wanted to join any of my board meetings, right? But uh, what it did is it solidified the fact that God does not call only older folks. He calls our younger children as well in order to lead out in worship. Number one, and this is where I want to focus on today, they had at least one faith-focused adult in their lives other than their parents. You know, I, I, I want to focus in on this one because we're talking about the plurality of faith. It is so important, I'm going to say this time and time again, to know the names of as many children as possible. If we don't know their names here on earth, 
then we're going to be ashamed that we don't know it when we get to heaven. It's important for us to know as many names, but not only know their names, but know what's going on in their lives. To let them know it's not just their parents that care about them, but their church family cares about them. Should I, can I hear an amen? amen. You know, we, Pastor Travis, it's all on you. You're the children's pastor. You take care of that. No, it's on us. It's on us to build a community of faith-like believers that encourages one another to grow in Jesus Christ. And then listen here. If that's not happening, then what are we here for? Well, I'm here to get to heaven. I want to see the streets of gold. I want to, I want to, I want to live eternally. Do you realize this? That we're going to be living eternally with each other. And that church is heaven here on earth. So if we're going to wait to heaven to get to know each other, it's going to be far too late. You still don't believe me. I can tell. James chapter 5. <laughs> James chapter 5, turn with me there. James chapter 5, we're going to stay there. James chapter 5, starting at verse 13. Now, the book of James is a a different book. Why? They were arguing whether to have the book of James even in canonical scripture. There are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, Matter of fact, at the very beginning of James chapter 5 here, he's, he's talking badly about some of the rich oppressors, right? Not just all rich people, but rich oppressors. And in the uh, early church, which is the original audience for for this book, they wanted to make sure that they had some of the rich people come in and say, we don't want to offend them. And so they were actually saying, we don't know. And another thing is that uh, what summarizes the book of James is probably James chapter 2, verse 17, which says that faith without works is? And they said, well, this kind of goes against what Paul says, because we're saved by grace through faith and not of works, lest anyone should boast. But what they're actually saying is actually the same thing. James is simply saying, no, it's not our faith that saves us. But if you say you have faith, I better as well, I I better see it. Matthew actually chimes in on this as well and says, by their fruits you shall. Amen, right? So in other words, it's not my fruit that is saving me. But as a result of me walking with Jesus Christ, you can see the fruit of my walk with Jesus Christ. And so we see this, and James continues on. He's pushing people in their faith to continue on in the faith. As a matter of fact, there at verse 12, right before 13, But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. And so the people are probably a little bit shaken as they're, as they're reading this. Once again, this is encouraging the early church, all right? I want you to get that in mind because we're going there. And it's, it's, uh, as I was reading and studying, James probably was martyred a little while after he wrote this book. He was all in. He, this is probably the half-brother of Jesus who was all in, who Peter calls a pillar of the church. And, and yet, we see what is he saying here. He is calling us to be in community. How do I know this? Verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Uh, I'm going to go through this, and then we're going to break it down a little bit more. But I believe uh, James was telling the early church to live life with yourself. And some of you say, well, of course we have to live life with ourselves. We're all here, aren't we? Well, are you here? Sometimes we are here without, without being here. Us men, we're very good at that, right? Uh, my wife said, you'll say, what did, what did I just say? I'm like, I have no idea. Thanks for calling me out on it, Right? Uh, but sometimes we are here, and sometimes you're, some of you are right here right now, and your wife is going to poke you in the side because you're checking some, uh, actually there's no sports on right now, but you're checking some sports on ESPN or whatever it might be. Some of you might be on your cell phones because you can be in a place without being in a place. This is why James was telling the early church, is, any, is anyone among you suffering? And this word is very interesting. Is anyone badly having misfortune? Then let him pray. If you're going through something bad, Talk to God about it, amen? But it says, don't wait till something bad is happening. If you're cheerful, sing songs. Uh, This is is singular, right? This This is okay. But then he goes on, is anyone among you sick? Come no, weary, fatigued, or ill. Are you any of these things? Let them, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. In other words, James is saying, live life with or under leaders. Have people in your life that you can depend upon when things are not going well, you can call upon and say, hey, I need help over here. You know, sometimes we, we, we don't realize this, but there's a lot of us and there are a lot of people back here that were suffering in silence. 
They were going through life all alone, and James is telling them, it should not be so. There should be people looking out for you. But notice here, I, I want you to notice here in this, this verse, uh, in 14, let him call. This word is proskaleo. This means you call for yourself. In other words, you call for yourself, the leaders, because sometimes we get upset because we're going through all things all alone, and we're wondering why no one's there, because you haven't asked anyone to be there. Do you realize this? That we are called to invite each other into each other's lives. In other words, I need to give you permission to enter into my life. And how do I do that? Well, we're going to talk about that as we move forward. Listen to this. Verse 15. And the prayer will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up. If he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Right? So it's talking about this anointing. And as you're anointed, it's saying that the prayer that, this per- that, uh, that the leaders are praying will save the sick. But it's not just a saving as far as their illness. Uh, because I know that I've had a lot of anointing services, and they all don't make it on the other side. But I do believe I will see them on resurrection morning. Amen? And this is why this, this word is so important. is sozo, which is for salvation. This is a holistic healing that Jesus or that God is after, that James is talking about. And how do we know this? He says, because the Lord will raise him up. And not only that, if he has committed any sins, this person will be forgiven because the church came together and prayed. In other words, live life with God with one another. That in the midst of our community, we're supposed to, yes, have the singular faith, but then we start seeing this plurality that's coming about. And not only this plurality, but this plurality, plurality that involves not only each other, but it also involves this vertical relationship that we have with God. And then I got messed up on verse 16. I went down the rabbit trail for a long time on this one. Confess your trespasses one to another. I'm reading the New King James Version to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. This is a different word from healed than it was saved. This means to restore to a state of wholeness. And I want to st- stop there just for a second. Confess your trespasses one to another, to one another. Now, some of your verses, it says, confess your sins. All right? Now, are sins and trespasses the same? Tell us, pastor, right? <laughs> you know, this is actually two words that are used here. Uh, so, parato- parato- paratoma, right? Paratotoma. Paratotoma is confess your faults and your trespasses. But then there's other versions that say confess your armartia, your sins. And as I was going through, I realized that this was a textual criticism. And listen here, I got really nerdy in first service. I won't get too nerdy right now because I was excited to go into this Dr. Kilgore. And as I was going through, I realized that the original uh, transcripts, manuscripts, actually shared that this was confess your sins. But as translators came about later and they wrote the Texas Receptus, they wrote it in Latin and they changed this word to faults, right? They, they changed this word because they said this is congruent with the rest of the passage and they didn't want people to believe that you had to confess your sins to people in order to be forgiven. Who do we confess our sins to in order to be forgiven? God. But let me, let me ask this question. If I go to, let me pick on someone, uh, Nathan, all right, Siri. If I go to Nathan Siri over here and I kick him in his leg and I go to God and say, God, forgive me, will God forgive me? Oh, so, someone said no. And someone said that emphatically. They said, don't you dare kick me, Pastor. I will not kick anyone, I promise. But Matthew chapter 5 tells us that if I have something against my brother and try to call before God, what does he tell me to do? leave my gift at the altar, and I go and I make it right with my brother, and then come, and then I confess, right? And so I need to, there's this portion where I confess to Nathan, but I also confess to God. I make it right between my brother and with God. But I believe that it goes even further than that. Let me first tell you about the problem that we're having in, 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 uh, that they were having here probably, which is although they're living in community with one another, there is still this standoffishness, right? They, they stiffed arm each other, which is I'll keep my brother and my sister at arm's length. Why do we do this? Well, first of all, I don't know if I can trust you and what you will do with the information that is going on in my life. Now, let me tell you this. There are some things that are going on in my life that only God will know, Right? There's some things going on in my life, though, that my wife will know, and she's not going to tell any of you. And there's certain things that are going on in my life that I have prayer partners that will know deeper. Do you understand? There's layers of relationships that I have, but sometimes I am the best liar in my own life. 
I can have repeated sins, whether that's pride, whether that's blasphemy, whatever it might be that might be going on in my life. And if I only keep it within myself, I'll continue to lie to myself. But if I have a community of believers that I, that I get along with, that I talk to, they can call me out as I give them permission to do so. If you still don't believe me, and I, I know as we said, we're going to stay in uh, James chapter 5. Acts chapter 19, there's uh, something crazy that happens. Uh, Acts chapter 19, verse 13, it says, Some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, We exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. But listen to this. Also, there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Now listen to this. this I, get, I chuckle at this. Well, okay. The man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them, so they fled out of that house naked and wounded, right? I'm like, I have no idea what happened in that house, but I don't want to know either. In other words, they didn't actually know Jesus, but they're trying to exercise spirits in the name of Jesus. But listen to verse, verse uh, uh, 17. It says, this became known both to Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on all, and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ was magnified. And many who believed came, and this is the same word, confessing and telling their deeds. Also, many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Right now I'm doing my Doctor of Ministry project at uh, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, right? The other Southwestern. And one of my professors talked about this service that I've never seen the Adventist church. And I, I believe there's a reason for that. And they call the, these uh, services revivals. And in these revivals, people will uh, be called. And there's an altar call. And you know what they do that's so different at Adventist church? They don't just have prayer over the people. They hand them the microphone. Uh-oh. <laughs> and one of my professors said, the most interesting things come out of people's mouths when the Holy Spirit is prompting them and convicting them. Sometimes right up front, people will, will say, I've embezzled, I've lied, I've cheated, I've stolen, and I want to confess my sin, and I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. He says, and the entire audience is caught up, and they're, they're crying in tears because they recognize some of the same sins that this person is confessing they're dealing with on their own. In our church, we have grown so accustomed to valuing appearance more than genuine faith, and it's time for that to stop. It's time for us, and listen here, I'm not telling us to, to go to everyone and just say, you know those people as well, like the, the testimony uh, uh, warriors, they'll get up and they'll, they'll tell all their secrets in front of the church. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being connected with people. Listen, listen here to the rest of verse 16, it says it all. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, of a righteous person, avails much. The effective, fervent prayer. There's a reason why this is connected with confess your sins, because we're supposed to be in life with righteous people that we can count on, depend upon, to help steer us in the right direction. And if there's something that you're struggling with, that you're going through, if you feel lonely, if you feel like your faith isn't there, there needs to be people in your life that will help sharpen you, but you can be honest with and say, I'm struggling with my faith right now. You can be honest with and say, hey, I have not been faithful in my tithe and offerings. How do you do it? And you're not worried that this person is going to say, hey, hey, Pastor Swoops, man, you won't believe what, what this person just told me. No. What are they going to do? They're going to stop and they're going to have fervent prayer for you. This word for fervent prayer, this inner gaze, this DAC, is a word that is meant only towards God. The, the person who is connected with God, that loves God, who begs and petitions on your behalf. Church, we need those petitions. We need those prayers from the saints of God that are willing to say, I'm not just going to pray for myself, I'm going to pray for someone else. And we need those people. Listen to this. James was not just saying, look for these people in your life. He is saying, be this person in someone else's life. You might say, well, pastor, I'm not righteous. Well, none of us are righteous except for the blood of the lamb of Jesus Christ. There's none righteous. No, no, there, there, no, not one, right? Am I, am, anybody else know that, Ann? 
that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is when I confess, not only, not only to God, but if I've done something wrong against my brother or my sister, when I, when I give that thing up and I repent and I turn towards God, that Jesus forgives me and he gives me his robe of righteousness for me to wear and for me to move forward with my brothers and sisters. Listen here, I love this. Live with dependability and accountability in the body of believers, plurality of faith. Verse 17 and 18, it talks about Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven and gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Live life with the word. He used an example saying, if Elijah can do it, who was caught up because, not because he was perfect, but because he walked with God. He walked with God at all times. Walk with God through his word. Walk with God with one another, whatever what we're going through. And, and this is the last point here. Brethren, if any among you wanders away from the truth and someone turns him back, I love this word turn, this, this, this epistrepho, this converts him back. Let him know that he who is converted uh, who has converted a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And I, I read this and I realize James is telling the early church to live life with service. Just this week, uh, my, my family and I were reading over different historical figures and it, it writes their, their life stories in a biographical way that's, that's very, very compelling. And one of the stories in there was Harriet Tubman. And as going through, Harriet Tubman was telling a, another a person that she had freed, she says, my child, it is impossible to be lonely while you're spending your time serving others. If you're lonely, if you feel like you're cast out, if you feel like you're downtrodden and you're waiting for the elders of the church to come and anoint you, if you're waiting on the elders of the church to come and support you, I'm telling you to stop waiting and to start serving. You know, a lot of times we say, well, I'm just waiting on the Lord. Well, if you're going to do what waiters do, then do what waiters do best. Waiters serve you. Waiters serve God by serving one another. So there's three points I, I want you to get in all of this. And first and foremost, find someone to hold you spiritually accountable. And I want to change that. Find some ones to hold you spiritually accountable. And don't depend just on those in your side of your family bubble. You need people that you're going to study the word with, people that you're going to pray with, people that are going to be outside of your homes. You're probably looking at me, well, what about you, preacher? Who are you, who are you depending upon? Listen here, I have a group th a thread with a group of us that have graduated all in 2006, and we text each other constantly. Uh, most of the times it's gifts and memes, right, because they're funny. But we also say, hey, I have this coming up. Can you pray for this? Can you pray for that? We stay connected with each other, but then I have another layer. Uh, every Monday, I preached on something similar uh, about this about two years ago, and uh, someone heard it and, and emailed me and texted me and says, hey, God is compelling me that we need to be prayer partners to hold each other accountable. And you might be saying, oh, I know what that means. No, no, no. This is hold each other accountable for being better fathers, husbands, and spiritually connected to Jesus Christ. Throughout the week, uh, listen here, we only, listen here, we're, we're men, listen here, I don't love talking on the phone, but 30 minutes every Monday at 9 o'clock, we talk on the phone, we pray for each other, and throughout the rest of the week, he texts me, what did you study today? Uh, well, what happened, Curtis, is I did, you know, I'm held accountable, because I need that in my life, because sometimes I don't hold myself accountable, and I need to hold, have someone else in my life that holds me accountable. And, and the reason why I share this is because we need to stop existing in the church and we need to start living within the body of believers. We need each other. So start utilizing each other and start being available unto one another. Next, care more about your faith than your appearance. How do you do this? By making sure we're giving ourselves to each other in service. God has not called us to be members. He has not even called us, and I dare say this, it's in a whole other sermon, he has not called us to be Christians. He has called us to be disciples. And disciples make more disciples. How? Through service to God and serving one another. How do we do this? I believe we're looking to turn those who are turning away back towards God. But if I'm always only concerned about myself, how is it that I will actually reach out to my brother or my sister that needs me in the moment when they do? Lord God, use me. 
Lord God, use me. And so if you're here today and you've been living in singularity in your faith, I'm asking that you start making your faith plural. Very last point I'll make here today. And whenever you read the New Testament, I'll give you an example. Uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Immediately think, oh, I need to seek for God first every day when I wake up. But you realize that he's talking to the, the multitude. This is the Sermon of the Mount. He is speaking in the plural. This is a second person plural, right? He is saying, you all, together, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these things will be added in Texan to y'all. The church would be so much further if we stop thinking about me and we start thinking about y'all. We start recognizing that my gifts and my talents, my abilities were not meant for me. It was meant for y'all. It was meant for us together in the body of believers with plurality and not singularity. So now as every head is bowed, eyes are closed. God, if you are convicting someone right now, right here, to stop living in singularity, I'm asking that God, you, you bring up in their minds right now Someone that you want them to come connect with. Or, Lord, someones. Lord, if it's starting a small group tomorrow, then, Lord, may it start. If it's, Lord, starting a prayer group tomorrow, may it start. If it's just having an accountability partner, a prayer partner, then, Lord, may we start living our faith out, not worried about our appearance, but, Lord, more concerned about our faith. And, Lord, when I say ours, I mean not just as singularly, but plurally. God, in plurality, may we live out our faith, and may you be with us just as you were with the early church, pushing us, Lord, to live out this life with one another. In the name and the power of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.